Hello and welcome to Stories of Resilience, our podcast series to promote an ace-aware nation in Scotland. Adverse childhood experiences touch us all in one way or another. This series explores the thoughts of those involved with the ACES movement in Scotland and we talk to individuals who have stories of resilience to share. I'm Gary Robinson. My guest today is Dr. Suzanne Ziedike. I know uh, Suzanne well, as many of our listeners to this podcast will do as well. However, the work and the name of Dr. Suzanne Ziedike may be new to some of our listeners uh, to this today. But Suzanne, so good to see you again. Thank you for being in the studio with me. It's brilliant to be back, Gary. Uh, I'm really keen to talk about a number of things in the podcast today. I want to talk about the conference. I want to talk about your view on ACEs and Scotland and uh, the potential of Scotland becoming an ACE-aware nation and everything else in between. But just take me on a little bit of a journey because it was the screening of resilience that was the combination of uh, yourself and Tina Hendry and then the involvement of Tigers with regard to the conference and Dr uh, Nadine. So just take me through the the, the potted history of 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 how it started and how did we get to this point where we've now got 1,700 people plus coming into the Armadillo in September? Gary, it is amazing. We do have 1,700 people plus coming. And beyond that, we have a movement on our hands. And that movement wasn't here two years ago in Scotland. And I think it's amazing what has happened. So in April 2017, Tina Hendry and I, with our organizations, Connected Baby and Reattachment, held a screening of a film called Resilience, which basically nobody had ever heard of. And we just wanted to be sure that Scotland had a chance to see that film because it was being screened in London. And so we hosted this public screening to make sure that we too had a chance to think about ACEs, about the biology that is affected when children experience pain and distress in their childhood. And We just really thought it was going to be one screening. And then the interest exploded. So across last summer in 2017, our partnership took that to 25 different communities in Scotland. 2,500 people saw the film, and then it exploded further. People who saw it went back and demanded that their local authority purchase the film, that their organization find ways to screen the film. Some people bought it themselves because I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I just knew at the time that Tina and I could schedule a screening, and then it happened on its own. Okay, the same thing has happened with the conference and with this partnership with Tigers. Pauline Scott, who's the head of Tigers, and I thought, I wonder if we could have a conference and we could invite Nadine Burke Harris. Now, to be frank, that takes money. That doesn't come cheaply. One of the wonderful things about the partnership with Tigers was that they had the capacity to manage a really bigger budget. And so we thought, okay, we could give that a shot. And we think people will come because Nadine Burke Harris had become really well known through the screenings of the film. And so we emailed her. And once again, I don't know what I thought was going to happen, But really, probably, I expected that she would say no, or that we might not hear anything from her team. And then she said yes. We thought, okay, how many people do we think will come? And we took the risk of booking the SECC. Okay, now, that was scary to me. The SECC, like pop stars and political parties book the SECC, not two small organizations. And the reason I take the time to tell that story is because I guess I reflect a lot on how do movements start. And they often don't start with the vision of a movement. They often start with a sense of, well, I could try this. We could try this. And that's what's happened. I want to keep on the film just for a second. Okay. Uh, what, what is it, if we can quantify it, that makes that film so special? Oh, that's a great question. We should get Jamie Redford back and ask him how he put that film together and what his thoughts were. Because I think a lot about Jamie Redford, who is the director of that film. And what I think really works about resilience is that he manages to tell the story of an awareness of a scientific insight. But he does it in a way that science doesn't often tell its own story. 
He starts by interviewing the scientists who discovered it. And they don't just tell their findings. What I think makes the film is that they tell the story of how they felt about their findings. So we hear Vincent Felitti and Robert Anda saying how they were laughed at, about how they were shocked by the findings that they have. And Robert Anda says he, he sat in his study and cried. He didn't know how much pain there was in America. And so when scientists tell you how they feel about what they're discovering, it tells the viewer how they're allowed to feel and, in fact, how they maybe should feel about scientific findings. And I think that's what's crucial in using evidence to guide policy and practice, is that we don't just need the information. We need the meaning of the information. And I think that's what that film gave us. And then it told us stories of what people are doing with that information. And I think that's crucial. So it tells us what we know, and it tells us how we feel about what we know, and it tells us what we should do about what we know, and it does all that in an hour. And I am astounded because we have been talking about ACEs in Scotland for a decade or 15 years. And there's a lot of people who've contributed to that, but we didn't have a grassroots movement based in the public till that film came along. That has made me think a lot about how you have public movements and how you get change. And I'm, I am so grateful to Jamie Redford for making that film. He didn't have to. And it has changed Scotland, that hours-long film. It has leads me on to my next question. Does that worry you? I'll tell you for why. If you listen to some of the stories of resilience to the people that we have spoken to in this series, that film and this movement is changing lives. Yes. It's also making people very uncomfortable in certain circles because of the sort of language that is being used, the way that people are very emotive, because we're talking about young people, we're talking about children. You and and the team uh, have have seemed to have lit a firework which has exploded and will continue to do so. Does that concern you? N no, but I think it's a brilliant question. It's absolutely the case that there are, I don't know, limitations, you know, restrictions on what the film is able to tell us about ACEs. So... The film doesn't explore nearly enough about babies' experiences. And I have colleagues who are concerned about that. The film doesn't explore what other language we might use other than trauma and ACEs. The, the film doesn't explore cultural context into which you put this information. Of course it doesn't. It's only an hour long. So while many people are worried about some of those limitations, I forgive it all of that. Because I think what the film did was tell enough of a story to get people interested. They don't feel overwhelmed. They leave hopeful. I think that's what makes it. It's a brilliant film because it, you leave a film that's talking about pain and distress and things that some people can't even contemplate. And you leave it hopeful. Well done, filmmaking team. Now, if we get smart and we take that as a starting point and not the whole story, then we'll serve ourselves because it's not the whole story. There are conversations we need now to have as, as scientists, as a society, as policymakers, as practitioners, as professionals, as families. There are conversations we are responsible for having. It's not fair if we see that as a limitation of the film. We need to now think about what language do we use? What language do we already have? So we've had GERFEC as an educational policy, getting it right for every child for years now. GERFEC overlaps with ACEs, but we didn't have the language of ACEs. Lots of education professionals will have GERFEC in their head. Many families out there may not be quite familiar with that term, but ACEs provides the why for GERFEC. It's not like another initiative. 
Ace, the children experience pain and distress, and it changes their biology, which is why we need to get it right for every child. We need to think carefully about how this should help us to think creatively and not create more pressure for people. What it needs to create is urgency rather than pressure. What we haven't had is enough urgency because we, I, I don't think that what we've understood is that stress changes biology over the long term. And that film really helps us to get that key insight. Let's, let's talk about parents for a second, because throughout this, a, a mirror is being held up to parents in Scotland. And, you know, we're, we're hearing quotes and we're talking in terms of very strong emotive language around bringing up children harshly, Carol Craig in her book. Um, also, uh, you know, do we, do we really like children? Well, we love our children. Of course we do. But there is this, what could appear as, as criticism of how Scottish parents bring up their children. And could that be perceived as criticism will add more pressure to parenting. And then subsequently, we might get pushed back from parents that go, how dare you tell me how to bring up my children? And no, I don't bring up my child like that. We make a mistake if we think this is about parenting. This is a societal issue. And we really need to take that on board because then we think more creatively and more effectively. This is not just about parenting. This is about teaching and social working and doctoring and sportsing and politicking. This is about how we as a society make our children feel part of us and make our children feel welcome and make our children feel loved and valued. Now, having said that, we don't have to make it that. We can make it all about parenting if we want. And then what happens when you do that is that you have a discourse that says it's those parents over there who are doing a poor job. It's not us parents, meaning it, it creates a divide between whomever the them and the us is. So I'm, I'm absolutely doing my best to try to keep the language and the public discourse from going down that route because it would be so easy. We've done that again and again. We make it about communities of vulnerability. There are lots of vulnerable communities in this country, in our country, but it, it's not about the them. It's about the us. And I, I hope that the call for compassion and curiosity and courage that has accompanied the growth of the ACES movement in Scotland, which I am daily grateful for and find remarkable because we could have, that could have got lost. But there are thousands of people insisting that we keep compassion and curiosity and what happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. We've, the, the movement in Scotland has taken that, you know, kind of, you know, to our hearts and are insisting that that be part of the way we roll this out. So that lets us see the much wider picture, because it's not just parents who can understandably feel guilty and concerned and criticized and confused. Teachers can feel that. Social workers can feel that. Politicians can feel that. Family support staff who will say, we've known this for years, can feel that. And I think that's really important to understand because then we understand that the first place that we as human beings go when we hear information about how we can do damage, understandably, the first place we go is to protect our own self, to protect our own ego. Because we want to think we've done good in the world. It's hard to think that we could have created damage that we never meant to. So part of the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we talk about this stuff? How, what language do we use? And let me give an example from the past that I often talk about, which is 1950s hospitals. Because mm -hmm. we've been here before as a country. In the 1950s hospitals, a film came out called When a Two-Year-Old Goes to Hospital, made by a social worker named James Robertson. And we were in the same place. We had new emerging data about how important relationships were, about how children's fear 
changes their biology and makes them withdraw into themselves. And that was the birth of attachment theory. And he went about hospitals trying to help staff to see how very standard practice was damaging children. And when he could make his data tell that story, he made a film. And films were very new in those days, in 1952. And he showed the emotional response that a child had to the fact that her parents couldn't come and visit her every day. And that was standard practice. And here's what happened with that film. Hospitals, nurses, doctors didn't go, Yay, Mr. Robertson, thank you so much for coming showing us how our standard, well-meaning practice is damaging our young patients. And when I tell the story that way, you understand why they didn't say that. Because it felt hard to hear. There's something that they thought was normal and they were just doing their best and they were just following standard practice. Damaged children. And the fascinating thing about that story about 1950s hospitals is it took them two decades to get the kind of change that he had been trying to bring about. I think we're there again. I think we've got another film that is trying to help us to see how we could do damage. If we are not courageous and curious, we will continue to shut down in the way that the nurses of the 1950s understandably did. So I think that this stuff takes courage to really face up to and to think, how do we put it into practice? And I have hopes that we're in a place to do that if we understand our own defensiveness. Do you think the ACEs movement in Scotland acknowledges that we previously, and still do in certain circumstances, bring up, and I'm not just talking about parents here, you know, so, so I understand completely what you're saying, but, but is there an acknowledgement that we bring up how we were brought up, if that makes sense? I think we're getting there. But I think we need to keep doing a lot of talking about that because that is hard to think about. And I think it's the wondrousness of this. I love this, but I like difficult thinking. I perfectly understand that not everybody likes difficult thinking. It takes courage to do difficult thinking. If you question how you were brought up, it can feel like you're insulting your parents. It can feel like there could be another way to live that you haven't maybe imagined? And are you saying that I'm not good enough and I didn't do well enough? And are you saying there's something wrong with me? (laughs) I mean, the interesting thing is that's what therapy does for you. You know, therapy gets you to look at, at your past. But people who get to therapy, I've usually come there because they're, they're struggling in some way and they think that therapy might be able to help. What ACEs gets us to do kind of as a country is is to do a little bit of that therapy, looking back on how our society brought us up. And not everybody signed up for therapy. So it's trickier. But on the other hand, this has happened lots of times before. Let's go back to the suffragettes. You know, when the suffragettes came along to say, we think women should be able to vote. Lots of women rethought their own experience of themselves as citizens of a society. And that led to women being able to vote. Now we take that for granted. Of course women can vote. But there was a time in our country, not that long ago, when women weren't allowed to vote. and That was just normal. So what I think is fantastic about the ISIS movement is that it gives us a chance to rethink ourselves. What kind of country do we want to be? Do we want to be the best place in the world to grow up? If, if that is to be more than rhetoric, and I think a lot of people want that, if that is to be more than rhetoric, We need to be able to think about pain. We need to understand that we can cause damage without meaning to. We need to be able to reflect on our childhoods and set a vision for what we want it to be like. And at the heart of that are children who feel safe, are children who know they can laugh, are children who can have ball games on green spaces. I'm really excited about it, despite the fact that to get there, we need to take more seriously the pain that our children suffer now and that we have suffered in the past. And there are more challenging or courageous conversations to be had then. It's interesting, isn't it, about the the term ACEs, those letters, A-C-E, little s, uh, adverse childhood experiences, how it's almost got two meanings now 
in in this country. It does. So ACEs, in terms of adverse childhood experiences, what they actually are. But ACEs now is referred to as ACEs, the movement, isn't it? So it's it is yep. it, there's a it's we've got to be careful. I imagine, and the media has responsibility for this. I would imagine about how we report and and how we differentiate one from the other. Would you agree? I actually think we all have responsibility for that. But in this case, responsibility is kind of a heavy term. So part of what has happened is that people have got f- familiar, some people have got familiar with the term ACEs, A-C-E-S, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Now, acronyms come about a lot these days, but the thing is that if you come into a discussion late, you can get confused. So there are some people who say, we need to use the word adverse childhood experiences. We need to keep that language out there so that people know what we're talking about. And let me go back even further. The term adverse childhood experiences was the term that Felidi and Andes and Nadine Burke Harris's team came up with. They could have come up with other words. The words like trauma get used, attachment theory was effectively talking about ACEs without using that language. So different terms can mean different things and be very overlapping. And we need to stay aware of that and not think that we're talking about something different just because we happen to be using a different term. That's where the acronym ACEs overlaps with one of the ways in which that's starting to be used in a new way, at least in Scotland, and perhaps in other areas, now ACEs means both an ACEs lens, an ACEs perspective, and now it also means an ACEs movement. So what ACEs gives us is a new way to understand adverse childhood experiences. An ACEs lens lets us understand that stress changes your biology, and that causes heart disease, cancer, liver disease, that increases the likelihood that that you will be depressed, have mental illness, perhaps attempt suicide. ACEs, as that word, is like a, a frame for thinking about pain. And now in Scotland, we have an ACEs movement that is built on that frame. We didn't have a GERFEC movement. <laughs> we didn't have a trauma movement. We didn't have an attachment movement. But we do have an ACEs movement. So there is something remarkable about the fact that the ACEs science, as told through that film, has helped us to think in new ways about the biological changes that come from distress and have moved people to want to do something about that. And if we can just kind of pay attention to the different ways in which ACEs is used, I think that will give us more power in our thinking. So the conference... Yeah. is the start of the journey, No, not the end. No, no. The conference is the latest moment in a journey that already started. And you could say, where does that, where is that start? The, so was it in April 2017 when a film came and two small organizations decided that they would do what they could, they would screen it? Is the start when the Violence Reduction Unit invited Vincent Felitti in 2007, but most of the country didn't wasn't aware of that. Is the start when the Gerfeck policy came? Is the start when James Robertson wanted to change hospitals? Is the start back to the Industrial Revolution when people thought we shouldn't send poor children up chimneys with no shoes on? When is the start? The conference is not a start. The conference is a moment along the way that helps us perhaps to see it in new ways. What is next? What does the government need to do? What do organizations need to do? What do you need to do? What do I need to do to take this forward and not leave it to somebody else? What is the overriding yay feeling for you at the moment? The overriding yay feeling is all those people who want to come. I stood on that stage and I thought, together, we managed to hire a building that will hold 1,700 people and more. And they want to come. And I tried to imagine what it was going to feel like to have that, that auditorium full of people 
who want to be motivated, who want to carry away enough confidence to start where they are and do what they can. And that's the thing that, yeah, well, you can hear it in my voice, because I think that's how kindness will roll out across our country. The government can facilitate that, but the government cannot ensure it. The only thing that can ensure kindness is us, and it takes courage, because sometimes it means saying, I will cuddle this child as she comes into nursery, despite the fact that our policy says we shouldn't. And sometimes it means trying to figure out how in a train carriage to help a parent who's overwhelmed and is getting sharp with her child, because actually she's embarrassed about everybody else on the train carriage. How do I speak up when I'm afraid people might laugh at me too? How do I speak up with support for that parent? How do I decide I want that sign down that says no ball games? Those are all acts of kindness, but they take courage. Solving ACEs is ultimately, it's about kindness. It's about listening to pain. It's about making the time to hear a story. It's about managing to somehow restrain my own irritation or my own impatience. I am responsible for being kind to you because I don't know your story and I don't know what happened to you this morning. If I can be kinder, I make a difference to a child in ways I might not see. I make a difference to the parent. I make a difference to the overwhelmed teacher. I make a difference to the politician who doesn't know what else to do. I have responsibility for being kind. And we live in a time where I don't think we think we have responsibility. We think we can say what we like. Social media makes us think that. I think we have responsibilities to say things that are helpful. I think... An ACEs movement is ultimately about that. It is about our responsibility to be kind. (laughs) That takes a kind of a faith because it doesn't sound big enough. Because when you've got a big problem, and we've got big problems, mental health problems, rolling out of, of, you know, an expanded early years problem, education outcomes that are suffering in Scotland, those are problems, along with lots of other things. To say the solution is kindness just sounds daft. And yet it is, because warm relationships in which children feel valued and feel like they belong and feel like they can take their problems to somebody and feel like they can bring their teddy bears with them, those kinds of solutions are about kindness. Ultimately, this movement is about kindness. And what I am excited about is that it feels like we are retaining that. So as a country, we can hang on to that and and understand that ultimately that's what ACES tells us about. It's not about scoring. That's an important debate. That might be helpful to us, but ultimately it's not about that. It's about kindness, because that's what our biology as human beings looks for. Then we will crack this. And I'm excited and hopeful, because people are resonating to that message. Well, you were absolutely right. I did have more questions, but as always, you've answered them all. (laughs) There they are. Thank you very much indeed for that. As always, very honest, very insightful. Uh, I take away from our interview kindness and compassion shone through and that will shine through over the conference uh, days. So looking forward to it, Uh, looking forward to working with you on the 25th and 26th and um, thank you for being brave with Tigers to make this happen in Scotland. Dr. Suzanne Ziedijk, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. That was Stories of Resilience, celebrating individuals and organisations who are helping to make Scotland an ace-aware nation. Find out more about ACES and the Ace Aware Conference this September in Glasgow at www.aceawarescotland.com.